there are even bigger challenges there than there are here. Um, some of you may have been to the suburbs of Paris or parts of Bradford in the UK, which parts of, not all of these neighborhoods, but these are largely, some of them, um, are predominantly Muslim neighborhoods and they would be equivalent to what we would consider ghettoized. So the two young men, or the few young men in Brussels that carried out one of these attacks in Brussels, they grew up in a ghetto. They had criminal records. They were in, engaged in this type of activity. Um, we don't really see those type of condensed, ghettoized neighborhoods as much with such a predominant Muslim community. We really don't see that as much in the United States. So what does that tell us? Broadly speaking, Muslim Americans tend to be better well off than other Muslim uh, communities in Europe. So higher medium incomes, higher educational achievement. Um, so we see that pretty much across the board. In Europe, the case is not, is not that. It's an underprivileged uh, group in many, many ways. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, European countries had hundreds and hundreds of years of colonizing Muslim countries. You can never forget that legacy of racial, ethnic, religious prejudice that is so deeply ingrained in European society, right? Unfortunately, what we're seeing now, post 9-11, is now America is going to these Muslim-majority countries. So now, it's sadly, um, it's almost like we're reliving what the Europeans had done previously. So we got to watch out. Okay. Please go first, and please do make sure that you pose um, your questions in phrase them as so I was listening to this really great Reza Aslan podcast, and he makes the point that facts and statistics never change people's minds, and it's personal relationships that do. Um, so the paradox I kind of find there is like, no matter how many um, data points you can give people, like the number of people in ISIS versus Muslims worldwide, that won't change your minds so and they'll rationalize it. But then the people who are hateful or fearful towards Muslims are also in a place where they're least likely to develop personal relationships with Muslims. So my question is, where do you begin to start to break that cycle? I would say first grade. Um, my father came to a speech that I gave in my hometown. It's a Unitarian Universalist space. And I was talking about the history of Islam on this soil, which goes back a long time, 1500s, right? So Muslims were on the soil before the United States even existed. We have to remember that. Um, but there was a teacher in the audience. Her name was Miss Gerber, and she didn't know who I was, but I remembered her, and she was like, you're totally right. We teach Thanksgiving, we teach slave trade is bad, and we teach about World War II when Europeans came over, but Muslims, are, uh, they were never included. I didn't learn about Muslims until I was 20. So it really starts in the educational system. Um, I don't see where else it can start, right? Because from school, you go home with ideas. And then from there, it's, it's a bottom, bottom up, I would say, no doubt. Um, I would say it's multifaceted. So you do need you know, education in the school system. Um, and I actually have a book recommendation uh, called Destiny, Destiny Disrupted uh, by Tamim Ansari. Um, and he's actually a history teacher, um, or not a history teacher, um, he is a writer of history books who was uh, amazed at the lack of information about Islam in basic history books. So he actually wrote this book to complement that lack of information. So yes, formal education is important. Um, but living in America with our celebrity culture, our entertainment culture, um, we can't ignore the importance of being involved in the entertainment industry, in you know, um, having relatable talking heads, and people like Reza Aslan. I actually um, used to intern for him at Binjan Studios. Um, and, uh, and it's really, you know, I, I kind of look at the LGBT community um, and the way that 
over just a decade, they were able to, you know, put on, um, I don't know all the shows, but like, uh, what was it, Ellen, and like, you follow all the shows that were on TV, all the way to Modern Family, um, and you see this progression of gay characters who are normalizing being gay, right? Um, and it's interesting to look at the way that TV characters affect us. Um, if you look at the, the character arc um, of a character in a film, they change from the beginning to the end of the film. In TV, people stay the same. So if it's I Love Lucy, she's a you know, naughty wife, and she learns her lesson at the end, but she's still like in that, um, contained in that construct at the end of the show. And so we actually subconsciously look to TV characters almost as family, family members that don't change. So I personally see that it's really important to um, have a two-pronged ap approach, um, and we have to just meet people where they are. If we have a very, you know, entertainment-based culture, then we need to we need to educate through that medium as well. Yeah. Hi, my name is Greg Hahn. I work for Interfaith Ministries, and I direct all their interfaith and interreligious work. So all this work across religious traditions is something that we work on to, uh, a lot. A uh, question particularly for Imam Wazir and Ms. Masnavi. Um, in our engagement with the Muslim community, we've noticed that there's been maybe a shift from dis Muslims describing themselves as Muslim Americans to American Muslims. And I just, um, if that's something you've seen, if that's something you've heard, and if transposing those words actually makes a difference. I think that your, your thought is, your, your comments are very insightful, but, but I think it's probably more of a reflection of individuals who feel like their Americanness may be questioned. And I think part of the challenge is the average American has never read the Constitution. Just ask just have I ever read it. They're not aware of even why the Declaration of Independence was written and the history behind the Declaration of Independence and that it's an argument that's, that's stating why we're separating, why we're making this bold step to separate. And the, the great message that's given in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When Imam W.D. Muhammad picked up the American flag and put it on the largest circulating Muslim periodical in America in 1975, one of, part of his major emphasis was helping Muslims at that time understand the value of America, especially those who had been denied this great promise that America has given. So it, if we see that as a trend, I think it's probably a reaction for, for people who may feel that their Americanness is being questioned. But I, I, I tell people, who has the right to question your Americanness? If, 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 if we, who owns a monopoly on the definition of being a good American? And if I go to, as a matter of fact, we hear people calling the president that he's not a good American. He's the president of the United States of America, and he's not a good American, right? And then, then on the other side, people say, well, just Donald Trump is just, he's just not American, right? So, so I think that that challenge in and of itself is problematic, and I think part of that can be done away through education and empowerment for all of us as American citizens to not let anyone paint us into a corner and try to define for us how we live and we understand the Constitution and how we enjoy the great rights that the Constitution uh, um, ensures for us. Um, so forgive me if I uh, understood the question a little differently. Were you asking about just the label, like the trend in how Muslims are labeling themselves? That's, that's okay. correct. As it's usually heard, I'm a Muslim American. Right. That seems, that's at least in our experiences. And I've heard this shift 
Um, and again, if, if, again, if it makes a difference, if that's something that resonates, um, and that's, that's the yeah. question. I mean, I, I can't really speak from, a, you know, an academic point of view, but um, I definitely have noticed that trend as well, probably in the last maybe five to 10 years. Um, and uh, I am someone who actually changed as well. So I used to say Muslim American, and then uh, I think my older si sister um, explained why I should say American Muslim, because I'm a Muslim first, you know, before I'm a, even a human being, I'm a Muslim. Um, and then what type of Muslim am I? I'm an American Muslim. So I, I, honestly, I think it's not really a conscious thing for most um, Muslims in America, um, uh, but for some of us it is, and I don't know if it actually makes a difference or not. I'm not sure. What do you think is the position of the LGBT community in terms of the American Muslim community? I would need to clarify your question. You say the position. Like, um, how do they, uh, it's, it's like such a vague thing, I'm not really sure how to word it differently, but how, um, like their interactions, like how do you think, like the, what, what's like the status of that currently, at least in America, and like where did that come from, sort of, if that makes sense. I think you may, we, we may would have to ask individuals from that community what their experiences are. And that will probably give us a better idea. But what I can say is after the events in Orlando, I was asked to come downtown and say a prayer. The mayor had a vigil and he invited the religious leaders to come downtown and say a prayer to recognize this human tragedy. And I think mature, uh, mature individuals recognize the fact that we have differences in the way we live our lives. And we respect the fact that people live their lives, how they live their lives. And, 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 and encourage that none of us discriminate against another individual because the way we live our lives. Because as Dr. Martin Luther King said, injustice to anyone, anywhere, is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, yes, I was wondering if you could explain the origin and some of the customs and the symbolism behind the recent religious observance of the Big Eid, and if you think a large-scale media blast to educate the masses could lead to the conversion of hearts that we need, or if it would lend itself to the monetizing of Islam? And finally, are there any tenets of the Islamic faith that wouldn't embrace such a public expression that I'm proposing of large-scale media edification? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. He asked some good questions. I can't remember. And to, 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 to adequately treat those questions are obviously beyond.